Three is a magic number. Oh, yes, it is. It's a magic number. And I'm not just saying that because it's a really cool Schoolhouse Rock song. Three is really an effective number. I mean, it's used in screenwriting with the three-act structure and the three primary characters. And we all know that a table with four legs is not as stable as a table with three legs, known as a tripod, right? Three is also an approximation of pi. It's also the very first Fermat Prime also, it's used in photography with the rule of three, where the subject of the photo is placed in the left or the right third of the frame. And finally, most songs use the structure of three with the chorus, the verse, and the bridge. But it can also make a major chord with three keys, three keys apart. Three is a magic number. So obviously, number three is an effective number, but it's not magical. Numerologists think that it represents creativity, energy, and possibility as based on the foundations of life, based on the past, the present, and the future. But honestly, numerology is a pseudoscience, and it's not based on anything that can be scientifically proven. Despite what some people would like to think, they think that pseudoscience is founded in the scientific method, and truth be told, it is not. And the same goes for math. There are some mathematical equations that are completely unsolvable and cannot be proved, despite what some inexperienced mathematicians claim to have miraculously solved. And some of these problems have been around for thousands of years, and even so, they still have not been proved. They're unprovable based on the parameters that they are presented in. This activity of solving unsolvable problems using basic, non-rigorous, non-peer-reviewed mathematics is known as pseudo-mathematics, also known as mathematical crankery. There have been pseudo-mathematical applications applied to the Millennium Problems, P versus NP Problem, Fermat's Last Theorem, the Collatz Conjecture, oh, and the three popular ones, which are the squaring of the circle, the doubling of the cube, and the trisecting of the angle. And those who have claimed to have solved these using non-rigorous, non-peer-reviewed processes are known as pseudo-mathematicians, or as mathematical cranks. Not to be confused with cranky mathematicians, because we've all met some of those, and some of those are actually really good mathematicians. In 1851, a gentleman by the name of John R. Parker published a book called The Quadrature of the Circle. The story is actually in this book by Peter Buckman. It's really a good book. And in this book, he claimed to have solved the squaring of the circle. The thing is, the squaring of the circle is impossible to solve. The challenge goes like this. You're supposed to find the area of a circle that equals the area of a square. Oh, and you're supposed to be using a compass and a straight edge. Those are the parameters. Okay, the problem with this is that in order to find the area of a circle, you need the value of pi. And pi is an irrational number, it's transcendental, which means it's non-algebraic and it is non-constructible. The point of me telling you this is because John Parker held steadfast to this belief that he had solved the squaring of the circle despite what academic mathematicians were telling him and showing him where the flaws were in his mathematics. Another impossible problem that I really love is called the doubling of the cube. And I actually talk about this in podcast number nine called Nigel Tufnell and the Doubling of the Cube. And I have it on my blog at my website, mathsciencehistory.com, where I also post the video of Nigel Tufnell singing Stonehenge. And the reason why is because nothing says math is important like watching an 18-inch Stonehenge figure dropped from the ceiling during a rock concert. 
The challenge behind doubling the cube also requires a compass and a straight edge. It's a mythical story that includes an altar in the shape of a cube, and each side is one unit. We'll call that unit L. And the story goes that the citizens of Delphi had been sent a plague by Apollo, so they consulted an oracle who told them that they needed to double the size of the altar. In other words, they needed to double the volume of the altar. In an effort to double the size of the cube, they decided to double the sides of the cube. Well, they were wrong. In doing so, they didn't just double the size of the cube. They made the cube eight times larger. So the volume was eight times more than what they started out with. In order to double the size of the cube, they needed to make each side about a quarter longer than its original unit length. However, the problem requires about a quarter of the length of the cube, which is approximately the cube root of two, which is also an irrational and transcendental number, non-algebraic and non-constructible. So the problem remains unsolved. So the doubling of the cube has been proposed since about 400 BCE. So it's over 2,000 years old and it's still unsolvable using the parameters of a compass and a straight edge. Several, not several, but many pseudo-mathematicians had been sending solutions to universities showing that they had proved the doubling of the cube and the squaring of the circle and the trisecting of the angle. Well, by the 17th century, the French Academy just said, enough! Enough, they are no longer going to be evaluating these solved problems because basically it's a waste of their time. Now, the cool thing about this, now this was the 17th century, this was like one of the first times that academia and academic mathematicians recognized that there was this thing, this pseudo-mathematics involved in society being used by pseudo-mathematicians. They didn't actually use the word, but... It was the first indicator that pseudo-mathematics was really prevalent in society. Another impossible problem is called the Collatz Conjecture. And I love this problem, it's one of my favorites. And the challenge goes like this. With the Collatz Conjecture, you pick a number, any number. I'm gonna pick the number 42 because it's the ultimate answer to the ultimate question. In this challenge, if the number is even, you divide it by two, and if the number is odd, you multiply it by 3 and add 1. So, since I'm starting with the number 42, I'm going to divide that by 2. Divide that by 2, I get 21. Uh-oh, it's an odd number. So I multiply it by 3 and I add 1. Then I get 64. Well, 64 is an even number. So I divide that by 2 and I get 32. 32 is also even, so I divide that by 2, I get 16. 16 is also even, so I divide that by 2, and I get 8. 8 by 2, which gives me 4. I divide 4 by 2, which gives me 2. I divide 2 by 2, which gives me 1. But 1 is an odd number, so I multiply it by 3 and add 1. Ah, I have 4. So I divide 4 by 2, which gives me 2. I then divide 2 by 2, which gives me 1, and then I have 1 again. Uh-oh, I'm stuck in a loop. I just want to clarify that this doesn't mean that anybody who attempts to solve an impossible problem is a pseudo-mathematician. On the contrary, on September 8, 2019, Dr. Terence Tao presented a partial proof showing that for the Collatz conjecture, it was almost true for almost all numbers. But even he knew that it was still an impossible problem to solve and the problem still remains unsolved. So let's talk about the history of pseudo-mathematics. The word pseudo is actually founded in Greek etymology and it means basically fake. So the word pseudoscience was first being used around the 17th century among scientists to show the relationship between religion and imperialism. Then the word was first published in 1796 when historian James Pettit Andrew 
referred to alchemy as this fantastical pseudoscience, which honestly, I think alchemy is really cool because it opened the door to chemistry, which is one of the most wonderful sciences to learn. The word pseudomathematician was first published in 1915 by the great mathematician Augustus de Morgan in his book, A Budget of Paradoxes. He then went on to define the pseudomathematician as a person who handles mathematics like the monkey handles the razor. And the analogy goes, is the monkey watches the human shave himself, and so the monkey takes the razor, tries to shave himself the same way, but doesn't know how to hold the razor, and in the process ends up slicing his throat. Augustus de Morgan then went on to throw James Smith, the pseudo-mathematician James Smith, under the bus because James Smith adamantly, adamantly published that the value of pi was three and one-eighth, exactly. So, the point of the story is, the label pseudo-mathematician is the ultimate burn. So how do we define a true pseudo-mathematician? After all, what's wrong with someone being completely enthusiastic about mathematics? Well, let's talk about peer review. Peer review is the process of sharing your work with your peers. So in academia, they share it with other academics. For those who have claimed to have solved these unsolvable problems, the work is reviewed, evaluated, and duplicated by other mathematical peers who can validate that the work is founded on rigorous mathematics and logic. What is wonderful about the process of peer review is that it opens the door to communication. It opens the door for other scientists, other mathematics, other historians, and other academics to talk about these findings and either build upon them or find out that they are false. If the work is submitted without peer review, if someone claims they have solved something as an unsolvable problem, but it has not gone through the process of peer review, then it is simply mathematical crankery. So back to Mr. Parker and his book, The Quadrature of the Circle. Peter Beckman, in his book, The History of Pi, which is a great book, by the way, I love this book. He goes on to write about Parker and how Parker, when his work was reviewed by other mathematicians and they showed the flaws in his work, Parker became very defensive and actually resorted to name calling. And he actually said that these mathematicians were among the least competent to decide on any newly discovered principle. Don't get me wrong. There is nothing wrong with trying to solve the unsolvable. The most beautiful thing about mathematics is trying to solve those things that have been pondered for thousands of years. And by doing so, it can alter your viewpoint and change your perspective on the beauty of mathematics. These are puzzles. These unsolvable problems are puzzles. And the exciting thing about these unsolvable problems is that they can engage a community of other mathematicians and scientists and create a level of discourse that can be absolutely exciting. And you don't need an advanced degree to sit down and give it a go. And who knows? You might find yourself so enamored with mathematics that you may find yourself back in college earning a degree in something you never thought you'd learn before. You may find yourself veering one way to learn math, another way to learn physics, and yet another way to learn chemistry, or even find yourself sitting in a history class, realizing that there's so many wonderful things in the world to learn. That's the power of math, science, and history. Until next time, carpe diem. If you enjoyed this video, please remember to like, subscribe, and hit the bell. Three things. Also, if you want more math, more science, and more history, come on over to patreon.com slash math science history, where I provide bonus math and early releases of my videos. And also, if you just want to listen to the podcast, you can find math science history on basically any podcast platform. So until next time, carpe diem.